Um, Jean Mayer, who studied a strain of a genetic, uh, genetically obese mice at, uh, at Harvard in the 50s, said these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. And right here, by the way, we start to see the answer to that question of obesity and malnutrition coexisting in the same population. If the animals can make fat out of their food when they're half starved, you could start to see how mothers can become obese while their children are half starved. The question is, what's dysregulating the fat tissue? So let's go to the next slide. These are just obvious questions, 43. You know, why, if vertical growth drives overeating, why not horizontal? You know, in animals, I have never yet found an example, and I always ask, of an animal in which the defect actually makes it eat more. The defects inevitably cause the animal to dysregulate their fat tissue. And if obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation, what regulates fat accumulation? And the problem is the Germans and the Austrians couldn't know this. Um, the technology to know what regulates fat accumulation didn't come into existence until beginning in 1956 and then 1960 when uh, Rosalind Yalo and Solomon Burson invented the um, radio amino assay to measure hormone levels in the blood with accuracy. But the thing to know, and this is my brief course on adiposity 101, and I can say I'm already over an hour, so I'm speeding it up a bit. Um, the key thing is we want to know how fat gets in the fat tissue and what forces keep it there. And in fact, what the laws of thermodynamics tell us is that an animal gets fatter when the forces putting fat in its fat tissue are greater than the forces take trying to get it out. So what we want to know is what's going on there. And there were a series of discoveries beginning in the 1920s about the metabolism of fat tissue. The first was that fat is metabolically active. It's not just this inert garbage can where we throw the calories we don't use. And in the 1930s, the fat cells are in a continual state of flux. Fatty acids, triglycerides are always cycling within a cell, and we'll get to that. And in 1948, Ernst Wertheimer, who's a Another German emigre who went to Tel Aviv was uh, considered the pioneer, the father of the field of uh, uh, adipocyte metabolism, said mobilization, he wrote a seminal review in physiological reviews, and he said mobilization, deposition of fat go on continuously without regard to the nutritional state of the animal. In the classical theory that fat is deposited in the adipose tissue when given an excess of the caloric requirement has been finally disproved. What I like about that quote is, in 1948, it had already been disproven what we believe is dogma today. That's how misguided this field was. So now let's look at adiposity 101. Slide 46. The key thing to know is that fat comes in two forms, triglycerides and fatty acids. You know, a fatty acid, triglyceride is formed of three fatty acids bound together by a glycerol molecule. Fat is stored as triglycerides fatty acids are burned for fuel. And the reason fat is stored as triglycerides is because triglycerides are too big to get in and out across the cell membrane. Fatty acids can flow back and forth without too much trouble. So fat enters and exits fat cells as fatty acids. Inside the fat cell, the fatty acids are bound with the glycerol molecule into triglycerides to be stored. And then they're continually broken down back into triglycerides and let out of the fat cell. So here's how it works. This is the triglyceride fatty acid cycle, and I'm slide 47. And you could see basically the fatty acids passing through the cell membranes on the left, being um, attached to uh, the activated glycerol as a molecule called glycerol 3 phosphate, combined into triglycerides, broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. If they're not, fatty acids aren't re-esterified, is the word, into triglycerides that escape from the fat cell. And so we want to know, in effect, is what uh, controls both the flow of the fatty acids across the membrane, the esterification into triglycerides, and the breaking down of the triglycerides back into fatty acids. And the key thing to know is that this is regulated by insulin. This was discovered within a year of having the technology necessary to measure hormone flows. This is slide 48. And um, basically what hormones do is they, you know, they say, tell our bodies to do something. Adrenaline to, to flee or fight, um, growth hormone to grow. Virtually, and in telling our bodies to do things, they also tell our bodies to make the fuel available. One of the first observations made once fatty acids could be measured in the bloodstream in 1956 was that if you infuse, inject somebody with adrenaline, 
they're suddenly their fatty acid levels skyrocket because the adrenaline tells the fat tissue to dump fatty acids into the bloodstream so you could use them for fuel in case you have to flee or fight. Um, of all the hormones out there, there's only one that everything it does works to put fat in the fat tissue, and that's insulin. And as Yalo and Burson put it, they said insulin is the principal regulator of fat metabolism. Um, by 1965, it was clear that the release of fatty acids from fat cells, this is slide 49, requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency, as they put it, or as the AMA put it in 1974, fat is mobilized from fat tissue and insulin secretion diminishes. Um, so in effect, insulin is a fattening hormone. If you go to slide five, again, I'm going to skip through these quicker. Um, it's been known since the first discovery of insulin, actually even before then. Um, type 1 diabetics, without insulin, they can't keep fat in their fat tissue. They will die emaciated, starving, and emaciated. And as Best and Heist put it, Best is the best of banding and Best in 1966. That the fact that insulin increases the formation of fat has been obvious ever since the first emaciated dog or diabetic patient demonstrated a fine pad of adipose tissue made as a result of treatment with the hormone. Um, slide 51. Uh, let's skip 51 and 52. Uh, type 2 diabetics, you give type 2 diabetics insulin therapy, they get fatter. I mean, this is a problem in clinical treatment of diabetes because you don't want diabetics to get fatter because they already have a high intake of um, a high risk of heart disease. Um, the ACCORD trial in 2008 is a classic example of a trial of intensive um, insulin therapy to keep blood sugar down, and there was a 7-pound mean weight gain in the intensive therapy compared to the controls. And nearly a third of the intensive therapy group gained more than 20 pounds. Now go to slide 53, and this is just the sort of ultimate de depiction of the effect of insulin as a fattening hormone. And this is from a textbook called Endocrino Endocrinology, an Integrated Approach, was published in 2001. And the, the box is the overall action of insulin on the adipocyte is to stimulate fat storage and inhibit mobilization. If you go to a biochemistry textbook or an endocrinology textbook and you look up what regulates fat accumulation in adipocytes, this is what you'll be told. And in this case, they said the remarkable effects of locally injected insulin on the accumulation of triglyceride into adipocytes are graphically illustrated in box 2.8. And this is a photo of this woman with these two large fat masses on her thighs. And it says the patient developed type 1 diabetes mellitus in 1941 at the age of 17 years. She injected herself daily over a period of 47 years with 60 units bovine soluble insulin using only two injection sites on her thighs, and the result of these huge masses of fat. It had nothing to do with how much she ate or exercised. Insulin makes fat cells accumulate fat. That's what it does. And so if you go to the next slide... This is the bottom line. And when insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. And when insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue and the fat depots shrink. And we secrete insulin in response to the carbohydrates in our diet. I mean, fundamentally, we secrete some insulin in response to protein, um, but in a mixed meal, if you look at the meal protein plus fat or protein plus carbohydrate, it's carbohydrate that drives insulin secretion. This is how George Cahill who's a diabetes specialist at Harvard. In 1965, Cahill co-edited a 500-page American Physiological Society textbook on this new science of fat metabolism, what they'd learned since 56. And the lesson is carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat. And a reasonable summary, as it was known in 1963, was this. This is 1963. JAMA runs a 12-page story, 12-page article on the new science of fat metabolism. It's written by this physiologist at the University of Wisconsin named Edgar Gordon. And as he says, he says it may be stated categorically that the storage of fat and therefore the production and maintenance of obesity cannot take place unless glucose is being metabolized. You need glucose for the glycerol molecule to provide to, to esterify the triglycerides. Since glucose cannot be used by most tissues without the presence of insulin, it also may be stated categorically that obesity is impossible in the absence of adequate tissue concentrations of insulin. <laughs>